Here's some of the things that should have told me I needed to get help <laughs> that didn't. The fact that I got like numbness in my fingers and toes and nosebleeds and I was a 22 year old who could not for the life of me remember something that had happened five minutes ago. If you phoned me and then said, what did we talk about? I wouldn't have been able to tell you because I was just not functioning. I wasn't opening my mail. I would get like bills stacking up and court summons because I was just so incapable of, of doing life admin. My sole focus was on how I was going to have fun. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Thank you for joining us on Unapologetic, helping you to understand, defend and share your faith with confidence. I'm Ruth Jackson. And before we hear from today's guest, I just want to remind you to head over to our website, premierunbelievable.com, where you can find more shows, resources and articles. And if you register or sign up for our newsletter there, you can get yourself a free ebook. Actually, I'm lying. You can get yourself a plethora of free ebooks. There are so, so many to choose from. So don't say we never give you anything. But now for today's show, I am delighted to be joined by the wonderful Lauren Windle, journalist, presenter and author of Notes on Love, Being Single and Dating in a Marriage Obsessed Church. Hi, Lauren. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This is very exciting. And we're going to hear a little bit more about your book and dating later. But Lauren, if you're up for it, I just want to go right back to the very beginning, because that's obviously a very good place to start. So kind of what, what was your experience of God growing up? Did you grow up in a Christian family? Are you from a kind of very non-religious family? Take us back to Lauren at, say, five years old. Yeah, so my mum's Christian, always was, and took me along to church along with my sister when we were younger. Um, I didn't enjoy church. I actually, I really liked Jesus and God and and Christ and and I loved the stories and and all of that kind of stuff. But it was the church environment and it was the Christians that I didn't the particularly, worst. I know that's <laughs> Christians. It, I think it was Gandhi. I can't remember who said like, oh, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was how I felt about church. And I'd seen youth leaders, you know, cracking onto the teenage women. And I'd seen um, vicars leave like their wives to be with members of the congregation and I'd felt judged and bullied and so basically when I was 13 my mum was like well you're old enough to stay home now if you want to do you want to come to church and I just took the opportunity as quickly as possible to not go to church because I just I really really didn't enjoy it. Do you think if church had been different you would maybe have stayed? I guess that's a hard question isn't it? Yeah, I definitely loved the things that not church offered. Like <laughs> I was, I was probably, I was smoking by the time I was 13, maybe 14 and drinking as well. And like had started, you know, whatever dating looks like for like 13, 14 year olds, like saying someone was my boyfriend and ignoring them apart from the occasional <laughs> snog. But like I thought, I saw myself as very grown up mm -hmm. and I, I wonder if a solid church community could could have pulled me back from that. I think probably like, you know, we'll we'll talk a bit later about what I've done more recently, but I'm an addiction specialist. And I remember looking at the looking at a paper, a really old paper in addiction that listed like the protective factors for young people to stop them going into addiction. And one of them was church. Mm. And like actually it's that kind of giving people a really safe place and a strong identity, having them rooted um, and having them know that they are welcomed no matter what, that I, I didn't feel. Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it probably would have made a difference. But I think that's interesting though, isn't it? Because you say that church is one of the factors, but it surely depends on what type of church, doesn't it? Oh yeah, massively. It could probably yeah. send you spiraling yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that because you did eventually end up spiraling, but it didn't start oh, yeah. like that, did it? So why don't you talk us through a little bit of, so you left the church, you know, you started smoking as a 13 year old, that yeah. then led to drinking and that sort of, talk us through the journey yeah, this is where I, this is the, the portion of my life where I freestyled a bit, I'd say. And like, I know, um, I probably would have said I was Christian, but certainly wasn't like checking in with God. I wasn't praying regularly. I wasn't part of a church community. Um, and I grew up in London and, 
And I oh, actually, I always say I grew up in London as if that makes a difference. But I have a feeling that this story is repeated like all over the country, no matter where you're from. But teenagers just drank. That's what we did. And I could drink quite damaging amounts, but I was hiding in plain sight because like, that's just what we did. It wasn't uncommon for one of my friends to get so drunk that they threw up or needed to be sent home or, you know, occasionally even would head into a hospital you know like that was just teenage drinking desperately trying to get served in the buy one get one free alcohol aisle in Iceland you know taking your dad's car keys and putting them down on the counter to pretend that they were yours when you were 14 years old and you were not kidding you know anyone but that was that was kind of the game and I and I really enjoyed it and I actually found in alcohol a solution to some social anxiety and I wouldn't have had that language at the time I wouldn't have known what was I just knew I hated being around people and was desperate to be popular and didn't feel popular and just wanted to be liked and was really scared that I was going to be ridiculed the whole time and I don't think that that went when I drank but I I didn't have to think about it I wasn't thinking about it if anything I, I probably actually was doing things when I was drinking that would make me unpopular or unliked Mm. or judged or talked about. But actually, like, as long as I was drinking, that that wasn't my focus. And that's what I needed. And it kind of felt like an escape, I guess. It felt like it wasn't a problem. It was a solution to my problems, you know. And that that was really amazing for a very awkward desperately scared desperately feeling alone teenager Mm -hmm. you know like you just have a swig of this and suddenly those feelings kind of start to dissipate like what promise you know but obviously yeah go on you you asked the question it did did quickly become a problem (laughs) didn't it how did it turn into that this isn't just a podcast to talk about the joys of alcohol (laughs) um no I mean it really did And, and what what started out as like you know just the the best sort of feeling very quickly became like a really gross feeling and I I started to cause problems for myself and for people around me and I I didn't have that much money as a teenager so I couldn't I couldn't cause too much chaos as a teenager but you know you head to uni you get a student loan you get a bit more freedom and and again, you're in an environment where drinking is completely normal, if not encouraged. You know, you head down to Belushi's because it's got 50p shots. You you absolutely like tailor your night around how you can drink as much as possible. So I loved it there. Um, but I think it was clear to people more so at university that I drank differently, that I drank more than other people. I would lose whole days to hangovers when actually I like a lot of people in university, they do feel hungover, but like they don't, they don't ruin themselves. Like maybe 20 years later when they're 40 and they have two glasses of wine and they're like, why? (laughs) You know, like these students are resilient for some reason. Um, But yeah, and I I just always took things too far. I was always the last one to leave. I was always the one trying to convince everyone to have another drink. And then when people started going to work and there's like that transition period where, you know, you think you can still drink like you did at university and then you go to work and you're like, oh no, I will Mm. lose my job that I Mm. care very much about and you and you rein it in maybe after a couple of days just feeling awful in the office and people stopped drinking like that but I didn't yeah. I carried on drinking like that and I got into a really destructive relationship where I was very codependent and then that guy after three years left me and we used to drink a lot together and I just felt like okay well what am I going to do mm. now all I had was all I had was like this degree and this group of friends, but then everything was changing. Everyone was like just taking that next step towards growing up, getting jobs and things like that, or going off traveling. And I had just lost the safety net of that university life and the safety net of that relationship. And I'd say if I wasn't already spiraling, that's when it was like corkscrew time. And there was a moment, um, you mentioned it in your TEDx talk, which is a brilliant mm. talk. You should definitely go and check it out. I'll make sure there are links below. Um, but you mentioned that you missed your best friend's dad's funeral because yeah. you were kind of so hungover and you missed the train. I mean, was that the kind of the beginning of, oh, gosh, I've got to do something about this. This is, this is too much now. It wasn't, and it should have been. 
it wasn't like you can I, if people are literally watching this like seeing me I had quite a strong reaction to that no one's asked me about that in years and I'm now nine years sober so we're talking a long time ago that any of this stuff happened more than a decade and I feel sick to my stomach about that her mum had died six months previously and then her dad and I was there for her mum's funeral and and everything but I had stayed up all night before her dad's funeral and it was actually the first night I tried cocaine and then I and I was just drunk and I didn't even look at the time and it was about 10 a.m and I was like I've got to get to Devon to her her dad's funeral like my best friend's dad's funeral and I turned up there still in my work clothes from the day before having not taken off my makeup having slept for like three hours on the train and I begged my parents who live in Devon anyway to pick me up from the station and drop me at the funeral and they did and like I just remember speaking to the woman who gave the the address who like kind of spoke to the injustice of losing two parents so close together and she was like oh we have to get you the transcript it was beautiful you know it was a really special service and I just remember feeling like the worst person in the world but that was the start that was like the start of it all really going downhill and it should that should have been enough but it wasn't so what was it then that made you think I need to get help here I mean Here's some of the things that should have told me I needed to get help <laughs> that didn't. The fact that I got like numbness in my fingers and toes and nosebleeds. And I was a 22 year old who could not for the life of me remember something that happened five minutes ago. If you phoned me and then said, what did we talk about? I wouldn't have been able to tell you because I was just not functioning. I wasn't opening my mail. I would get like bills stacking up and court summons because I was just so incapable of of doing life admin my sole focus was on how I was going to have fun and for me fun was um as a kid actually I was given this book by Ishmael called Children of the Voice and in it they talk about fun like with an f like actual god wholesome fun and then they talk about another kind of fun which is spelled in the book with a ph and I'd say like I was having like p h u n fun mm. the whole time you know and like and that was it. And it was just my focus was just on like getting drunk and convincing people to pick up drugs and staying out as late as possible, going dancing, sitting up, talking rubbish all night and then just seeing if I could get away with it until the next night. And that was it. And I was so nocturnal and I was obviously, I mean, listen to that. Of course, I was having trouble at work. Of course, I was turning mm -hmm. up late. Of course, I wasn't performing like I could have. But I was taking a lot of drugs with people from work. So they were less mm -hmm. likely to challenge me on that behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely let down friends. I had friends like say, you know, I can't do this anymore. I, you know, I'm finding it too difficult to be around you. I would never make breakfast plans because I just wouldn't show up because I would still be drinking from the night before. You know, so many times I would like get in a stranger's car or accept drugs from a stranger or just go off on my own, like put myself in real physical mm -hmm. danger. And it's, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful that nothing physically like, you know, that I that I wasn't attacked or anything during those times. What, it really came to a head when I was out with... Um, a good friend of mine lived in Paris and she was back in London and a few of us from university had gone to a French restaurant to kind of like hear about this fabulous, like this is years before Emily in Paris, but it's still what we pictured of her yeah. life. Um, and I remember like just sitting there with her and, and a couple of others and it was a Thursday night and I was like, great, after this we'll go to a bar and then I'll get everyone to go to a club and blah, blah, blah. So I went and picked up um, two grams of cocaine, which is probably enough for two addicts like mm, no that's probably not look every everyone takes different amounts so I don't want to sort of like because someone will be listening to that and be like oh that's I get that quite a lot like oh what training wheels drug use but like you know that it was it was too much for one person particularly of my size right um and then I got back to the restaurant and they were like oh I think we're gonna call it you know or oh, 10 30 I mean they were normal they didn't take drugs they were like 10 30 lovely dinner I think we'll head home so I just went home and took those two grams myself. I, I got an ex-boyfriend round to sit up with me. 7.30 comes, my alarm's going off to tell me to go, get up to go into work and I'm still high. In fact, I've probably just done my last line and I called my boss and I just said, I'm high, I'm not coming. And she said, okay, you know, I'm gonna mark you down as, as ill, but 
we need to have a really serious conversation about this. And I, and she had seen the progression. I think she knew that I was, yes, reckless, but also like really in need of help. Mm-hmm. Um, so she was kind about it rather than angry. And then after that, I called my sister who worked in the city. And I said, like, after work, can you come to my flat and see me? And she's the prodigal one who stayed and got no credit. So she came over after work, six o'clock. And I just said, like, I'm, I'm taking cocaine and I don't know, I don't know how to stop. I don't think I can stop. And it wasn't a massive surprise to her. I'd really distanced myself from my family and they definitely knew I was partying a lot. Definitely knew I smoked, definitely knew I drank. Um, but I don't know if she had, she was fully aware of like the sort of drugs and, and the extent of it. And so she, you know, Saturday morning, she moved me out of my flat, moved me into her house. Sunday, she took me to a church and on the Monday, she sent me into work with a pre-typed resignation letter and told me, hand that to your boss. You know, you're going to get out of this lifestyle and you're going to make a positive change. And I didn't get the church thing. You know, I was happy to live with her, but a bit annoyed because it felt like moving in with my mum. Because <laughs> she was like, okay, what are you doing now? Are you mm. coming home now? Are you are you going to be here? Um, and then the church thing was like, yeah, they all seemed like really nice people. Um, And in my head, I was like, oh, it's so nice. I think they like do stuff with homeless people or something. And that was kind of like what they were talking about, like, oh, really lovely. But whatever the sort of God element of it, I I just felt really distant from, Mm. um, which my sister was gutted about. And then, um, yeah, and then I I quit my job. And she said, what are you going to do now? And last thing I remembered was hearing all about this Emily in Paris adventure. So I said, I'm going to move to Paris. Um, And I just rocked up two suitcases I was there for about nine months still drinking, but my drinking was so obviously bad in Paris because Mm. French culture is to like really enjoy wine and alcohol. It's, you know, they have far less of that like binge drinking thing that we have in the UK. So like next to my peers, I looked like an absolute wreckhead, you know, whereas in England, I could kind of get away with it a bit more. Um, and then I started dating someone who worked at a nearby restaurant, clocked off at like midnight, one o'clock, and would bring cocaine round. And that's when my friends who were there, who didn't take drugs, said, no, you were not, we're not having this. You've, you've mm. moved country to get away from this. And now you're going back down that road. Yeah. We want you to do something about it. So on 22nd of April, 2014, you got sober, which is a massive, massive achievement and yeah, huge, huge well done for that. <laughs> um, how how did that happen? Because obviously that must have been quite a big thing, com- you know, yeah. compared yeah. to what you were doing before. Yeah. So um, my friends, when they did this, like mini intervention, like they wouldn't have used that word, but when they were like, no, like we need you to make a change, they found a... Um, cocaine addict support group meeting that was bilingual in France and they asked me to go to it and I I said I would and I put it off for a few weeks and then it was the um yeah it was that 2014 22nd of April date and I turned up knowing nothing really and I thought also that like oh what a great story for me to tell at the pub about the time I went to one of those meetings I'd seen like the American tv shows like hi I'm Lauren I'm an addict and I was like expecting all of that and I was like quite pumped for it really and it stopped being funny like quite quickly and Mm. I stood at the door of um stood at the door and I could hear people speaking French and I remember thinking like I'm just not gonna walk in like there's just no way I can do this and then um, there were like some stairs that you walked down, but also a lift just next to the stairs. And I went to walk down the stairs just to go home. And the lift door opened and this woman came out and she was, said something to me in French and my French was rubbish. And I was like, oh no, no, no. And she said, are you here for the meeting? And I said, yeah, I am, but I've not, I don't know. I, I think maybe they're speaking French. I don't know if I'm in the right place. And she just like looped my arm and said, you can sit next to me. And like brought me in and it was a really small meeting. And usually if you go to those drug addict meetings there, they can be quite male heavy and just that little bit older than I, I was 25 at the time. And they're, you know, often around the sort of 50 mark in terms of age. But this room was just full of of women in their 20s. And most of them were about three months sober. And I just cried while they talked I just like tears streaming down my face and they all agreed to speak in English um for that meeting even though it could be either one didn't speak um one spoke in French because her English wasn't 
super strong but everyone else like made a real effort for me and I and they took me for lunch afterwards and there are a few things that I'm just like oh my goodness god like how did you put this like how did you design this for me one was like when I was when I was using and I, I wasn't washing properly and I wasn't opening my mail and all of that kind of stuff every now and again I would have a hot shower and I would like moisturize my skin and I put on clean clothes. And to me, that was like lying in the sand. This is where your life changes. You've done something good for yourself today. And that was probably like once every, like twice a year maybe that I did that in those years. Um, so it's really quite miserable. And I was sitting there with them and one of the girls, and I didn't ask her anything. She just turned to me and she said, um, you know, I moisturize every day now. And like to most people, that means nothing. Mm. To me, that was like, I could have one of those days where I feel like I've looked after myself, where I feel like I've taken charge of my life and I'm doing something good and I'm proud of myself. I could have that every day if I do this, if I do what she does. And that was mind blowing to me. And I said to them, like, if I want to stop taking cocaine, can I carry on drinking? And it was just a resounding no. Like, and I needed that. If you give me an inch, oh my goodness, I will be riding that inch for years, you know? <laughs> and they were just like, we don't, we really don't believe you can do this without cutting out all mind altering substances. And that was a blow to me, but it was exactly what I needed to hear. And I called my sister afterwards and I said, they told me to stop drinking and she did not skip a beat. She said, do it. I think this will be the best thing you've ever done in your life. And that was it. I never had a blowout. I never went one more night. I never did a last line of cocaine or a final bottle of this or glass of wine or, you know, whatever. I I just stopped. And at first it was like, I don't like, you're just white knuckling. You wake up every day and you're like, A, how are the days so long? <laughs> like how, when you're not sleeping until midday and then around six o'clock starting drinking, it's like, what does everyone do with all of this time? <laughs> they they moisturise, Lauren. <laughs> they moisturise. They're so busy moisturising. And that was the revelation, you know. And like, and I get to like eight or nine o'clock and I just go to bed because it meant I'd done another day, mm. you know, where I hadn't drunk. And I agreed to go to 90 of these meetings in 90 days. So one a day for three months effectively, just to replace the prominence that mm. my addictive behaviors had had um and yeah and it was I mean it was incredibly difficult and it was really scary and I remember feeling like particularly in those early days like just so vulnerable and so easy to bruise and just scared just yeah. scared that I was trading like the misery of addiction for the misery of abstinence and yeah. terrified that as a 25 year old this was this was it. I was going to have a half life going forward because, you know, socializing and seeing my friends with everything. And I didn't know a world without mm. drugs and alcohol. So that's a massive thing in and of itself. But at that point, you hadn't found God, had you? I mean, obviously, there's the 12 steps which have sort of God or, or a higher power kind of at mm. the center. But how did you discover, rediscover God in the midst of all of this then? Yeah. So meeting three of my 90 meetings in 90 days. And I remember it really clearly because the guy who was doing the main sort of talk, I remember saying, I'm on my third meeting of 90. And he just went, just 87 to go. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh gosh. So manageable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you for breaking it down into bite sized chunks for me. But then he went on and talked and he talked about his higher power. And actually, I don't think the higher power he was talking about was Jesus and God but in those sort of group settings you're quite careful not to specify because some people have real resentment towards an institution or institutional sort of religion so they want to keep it really open and accessible um despite the fact that though like the 12 steps and stuff was written by christians with with mm. christ in mind um to an extent that's that's been pulled back to accommodate people who don't share those beliefs so i was listening to this and it was the the message i got was you need to work out what your higher power was and i thought okay well i've been to church before um i'll check that out I just almost just out of habit because it's like, well, where else would I start? I don't yeah. really, I went to a C of E school, you know, all of that kind of stuff. 
Um, so I Googled it and I went to the first church that came up on Google when you search English speaking church in Paris. And I rocked up and they said that thing of like, if you want prayer, come to the front. Um, so I went to the front and I said to the vicar, can you pray for me, please? And he said, yeah, of course, you know, what do you need prayer for? And I said, I'm five days clean from a cocaine addiction. <laughs> what do I do? And he was like, okay, this is not a drill. <laughs> Sit down, like pulled over this amazing married couple. You know, do you mind if we put our hands on your shoulders? Can you repeat this back after me? I did all of this stuff and I was like, this is weird. They've really gotten quite dramatic about all of this, you know? <laughs> and they invited me to a women's like Bible group, um, which was the following Tuesday. So literally one week anniversary of my sobriety I rock up at this uh the vicar's house and it's his wife running it and the first thing she said was like I just love you Lauren and I was like okay this is so weird it must be a you cult you don't know me <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> please don't hug me please don't say you love me whatever this lie is I'm just gonna get out of here as soon as possible and they were like turn to your bibles and I was like and I have a bible and she was like beside herself but I didn't own a bible and she went to get one and my bible is still the bible that her daughter was given on graduation from bible college because it has like the like dedication in the front but she was like you have this you have this um and and then they went around the circle with these women and they said like just tell us what you what you've seen in Christians that you really like like what do you really like and some people were like I just love the generosity a lot of them were American which is why I'm doing this <laughs> the nervous just a rubbish French accent I wasn't gonna <laughs> yeah. say anything yeah. <laughs> there were some French ones like oh I've seen a lot of kindness and you know all of this kind of stuff That's better. But, yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and then they came around to me and I was like, nothing. I haven't, mm. I haven't seen anything I like in Christians. I'm here in spite of what I've seen mm. from Christians. Like despite them, I've turned up and I want to learn about Jesus. But the Christian thing, you can keep it. Like, and I listed off some of those things that I said to you from my childhood. And um, I looked up and this vicar's wife just had like tears running down her face. And she said, um, like, I know that wasn't me. I know that I wasn't there. I didn't leave my wife and, and get off with someone in the congregation. And I didn't bully you or beat you up or judge you. But I'm so sorry. Like, I, on behalf of us, the church, Chris, I'm so sorry that that's how you've been treated. And that's how people have behaved. And that's what people have shown you. This is that this is what's about. Like, please give us the chance to show you something better and something lifted off of me wow. just in that moment like oh, just this anger this weight was just gone and I was like I'm I'm gonna give this a real chance mm -hmm. and I think you know and she's right it wasn't her personally you know but I I just I needed the apology I needed the corporate apology from someone and she had the humility to to offer me that it and like there was nothing about that that was performative. You know, yeah. she, she saw what I needed and she, and I, and I just, I was just blown away. So I kept, I kept going. I kept showing up. I kept staying for coffee afterwards, which is horrific when you don't know anyone and you're not really sure who like Christians, you know, yeah. but, um, and I found a real family and a real community and people like, and a group who, you know, particularly that women's group, the other woman who ran it was this, Ukrainian woman who had grown up in like a church where you couldn't wear earrings because they were too flashy so very different from from yeah. the background that I had but between them the gentleness that they showed me and the kindness and and they never tried to make me a perfect Christian you know they just took it one day at a time with me they knew I smoked because I'd given up the drinking and and the drugs but I still smoked and they were like okay Lauren leaves church and has a cigarette and that's where she's at at the moment and we're mm. praying that she won't be there forever or even for long but she's 
she's at the moment we just want to make sure she knows Jesus and and like we'll see what happens with the rest of that and and that's not something everyone gets in church you know I remember there's an amazing woman in recovery who runs a center in East London and part of her testimony was that she was smoking outside of church and someone when she was still an active addict and um someone came out and was like Christians don't smoke and and she was like oh gosh I better not tell them about my crack pipe then (laughs) (laughs) You know, so I was, they were very open handed with me and gave me the opportunity to explore what lifestyle changes Mm. may come down the line from that. But first off, they were just like, let's just show you how loved you can be. And that was really special for me. So your life obviously began to change from that moment on gradually. Mm. I mean, this is going to be a really tricky question and certainly tricky to get it into like a concise thing. And, you know, without wanting to sound like the great Nicky Gumbel, what difference do you think Jesus has made to your life now, Lauren? Oh, Nicky Gumbel. I hope one day he asks me that question. <laughs> That'd be cool, except he's retired now and and I didn't come to faith in Alpha, so it feels unlikely. We could just Photoshop my, you know, his face onto mine. <laughs> there is a bit of the Nicky's about you, Ruth. Oh, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, oh, my goodness. Okay, so let, let's start with that whole, like, giving up the thing that mattered most for me Mm. and, and worrying that life was going to be rubbish afterwards. And, and I, I gave up that one thing and I gained everything and I never saw that coming. And I, what to me was boring before, like just became so special. And I started to feel so grateful that like I moisturized every day, you know, and every time like, I remember someone saying to me really early on in recovery, like, oh, you think you're so rock and roll. You go to these parties and you do this and you take your drugs and blah, blah, blah. But actually, like, have you watched a sunset? Have you watched a sunrise? You know, like, have you sat with people who care about you, like sober chatting into the night? You know, all of those things. And I I was just like, I didn't believe it. I just thought they hadn't tried the right drugs. (laughs) But honestly, you know, like the ability to have a a level a leveled off amount of, of fulfillment and joy and and I think happiness is a bit of a shallow term but at times happiness sure um but to experience those things and know that I'm really feeling them and to know that they are they're real and they're good and they're fun with an f and not with a ph you know and that I can be proud of them and to be asked to be a child's godparent when people wouldn't leave me alone with their kids before, Mm. you know, like all of those things, like to see the look on my parents' face when I do like a talk or when I go and speak at a church near them where they live in Devon. And then, and then when they, you know, when I, they tell me they've given a copy of my book to someone like, Oh, no one was proud of me. I wasn't proud of me. I hated myself, you know? And, and to, I think it took me years, though, to like myself, even love myself. Like, I think I believed I was worthy of all of my ill treatment at the hands of other people and at my own hands as well. I believed that that was a representation of my value. And that didn't shift quickly, like four years, maybe before I started to be like, okay, maybe the fact that God loves me means that I'm worth more than that. Mm. You know, but you can say that in your head and it doesn't drop down to your heart and it's just consistency. And to have people consistently show up for me. And I was sure that when people knew who I was and what I'd done, it was a year and a half in that church before I stood up in front of everyone and told them this whole time I've been in recovery and and I never said anything. And that was when I got baptized. And I just thought, like, who's going to, when they know, like, if they really knew the things I'd done and said and thought, like I wouldn't have any of these people and I don't deserve any of these people. But people just kept showing up. People still cared about me. People still loved me. People didn't give up on me. And it was like, it blew my mind, you know? It changed everything. I had a solid foundation on which I could build my life because I knew I was loved. I knew who I was. I knew I had a community I could fall back on and support. And then later, I found a bit of purpose. And I'm not saying that, like, God gives you this sort of one calling, and for some people he does, and then that's it. But, like, just in the day-to-day, 
I, I felt I developed my relationship with God, with Jesus enough that it was an ongoing conversation. Mm. And I knew that I was where I was supposed to be. And I loved every second of it. And it's like, imagine, imagine I'd stayed in, and the life I had around me when I was using was so small. I boxed myself in with people who didn't really care about me. And in a routine that meant that I never did anything different, I just drank. And sometimes in different places, but I drank and took drugs and I picked up drugs from the same people every time. And that was it. And it was just this miserable, tiny life. But I didn't know how good life could be on the other end of it. So I didn't know it was worth fighting for. Mm. And I'm so pleased that I like crawled and I mean <laughs> crawled my way to a better life so that I know that that's possible and so that I can tell people that that's possible and that you're never too old or you're never too young and you've never gone too far and you've never you know you've never pushed it so much or used too much or annoyed too many people to turn this around and to find you know either restore or find family and community and love through God. And that's like, I just can't believe it. I honestly, it is literally like so unbelievable, you know, <laughs> like, that's it. <laughs> Lauren, it's been nearly nine years since you've been sober, which is so, yeah. so incredible. Do you think that would have been possible without Jesus? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes and no, right? Yes, I do believe. I don't believe that the only pathway to sobriety is, I mean, it's not because there are loads of people who are in solid sobriety who don't believe in Jesus. I think you can do it if you're non-religious. I think you should do it if you're non-religious as well. You know, like I I feel pretty evangelical about recovery full stop because it will you know it will open up so many things in your life even if you don't have the faith element that's so important to me so yes I think I could have would I have oh my goodness I'm so pleased I don't didn't roll that dice <laughs> <laughs> like, like Jesus has, has been a huge part of my recovery and incorporating God into the 12 steps, which is something I did later because I, I worked the 12 steps several times. And the first time I did it with my sponsor who wasn't Christian, but was very, you know, really encouraging of, of any spiritual life that, that I found value in. And for me, that was Christianity. Um, but then I did it with a Christian. And, and when we were talking about higher power, we talked about Jesus. And when we talked about the different steps and the stages that you do, we looked at the biblical response to those things and the biblical support for them, you know, things like acknowledging that God is in control and that you're not, you know, like that's, that's pretty Bible 101, isn't it? And then things about like identifying character defects, apologizing where you've been wrong, you know, not carrying resentment. All of this stuff is is in the Bible. So we kind of pulled those things together and it was at, like, it's just spectacular. And, and God is so woven through that process and that journey. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to do it without Jesus. And I think it would have been a lot harder and it would look very different. And I'd say, a lot of the benefits that I have now are from sobriety, but more are from my faith. Lauren, we're going to hear a bit more about your journey and particularly your kind of, you know, the, your book notes on love and yeah. singleness and dating and everything <laughs> like that in the future episode. But as we come to the end of this episode, um, again, this might be quite a difficult question to answer. But if you, as Lauren today, could go back to, let's say, 24 year old Lauren, kind of in the peak of all of this mm. um, drinking, taking drugs, you know, the kind of the beginning of the spiral, I suppose, what would you say to yourself? with everything that you've learned along the way, post, post recovery, post finding Jesus, what would you want to say to yourself? I think, gosh, I mean, I'd like to, if I was literally like plonked in front of myself and given the opportunity to give myself advice, I'd like to say like, you know, get a therapist, rock up at a church, you know, all of those kind of things. But I wouldn't have done it. I I really wouldn't. Even, mm. even the sort of ghost of Lauren present would not have like Lauren future would not have made me do that. I think at that stage where I was already significantly down the spiral, I would say like, hold on, it gets better because I, ha I just felt so hopeless then. And I, I think I'm really... I'm really pleased with how 
my life has turned out. And I'm sure that there was a better path that didn't involve that level of pain to myself and to those around me. Um, but actually, like, there's a thing in, in recovery that almost sounds crazy, but people will say, like, they don't, they don't regret the past or wish to close the door on it. And I really, I really do feel that way. Like, I'm not proud, but I, I can see the impact that that journey has had on my life. And then subsequently on the, on the lives of the people who I chat to about it, who I come across who are in recovery or in addiction themselves, even, you know, and people who care about those people as well, like that's really important. So I would just say like, hold on, don't lose hope. Like God's coming for you. Well, Lauren, we're going to make sure that there's lots of links to your website, which has got brilliant sort of resources for if people want mm, to get yeah. out of addiction or start this journey. Um, but just as we finish, is there anything you would want to say to anyone who is kind of in that place that you were in? I suppose what you've just said is really helpful. But if there's anything extra you'd want to say to someone who is in that place, who's desperate to kind of get out of a place of addiction, any advice or thoughts you'd you'd want to share with them? Yeah, I would say the most powerful thing I've ever heard anyone say and the most powerful thing I said was help me and like I don't know anyone literally not one person who is clean and sober because they locked themselves in a room and did it themselves like it's so important that you connect with other people who have had that journey who are a couple of steps ahead of you who will listen to you who will not judge you and you can find those again with the the links that we've discussed there's loads of resources there there are charities there are anonymous fellowships there are support groups there are churches there are churches with specific recovery and addiction support groups you know and you think that you can't say stuff to a vicar but my goodness they have heard it all before so like just You've just got to bring it out of the darkness, bring it into the light to give yourself a chance to really make a positive change because you're worth it. You're so valuable. Like your your life, what you can do with your life, the, the relationships, the connections you can build are not worth throwing away for that one thing that's consuming you. Lauren thank you so much for sharing your story and thank you for your vulnerability and your example and we're going to be hearing much more from you in the next episode but thank you for joining us today Lauren thanks for having me unapologetic from premier unbelievable for more shows resources and our newsletter visit premierunbelievable.com